Hello, Vera. Thank you very much for taking the time to share with our audience about your research. Uh, Google Calico recently published a paper about naked mole rats suggesting that these animals have no increased mortality risk as they get older. Uh, this would imply that this species is negligibly senescent. We know there are other species that effectively do not age, but this is a first for mumbles, isn't it? Uh, well, yes, now this is very unique and the data from naked mole rat uh, demographics uh, well, it's really impressive. So do they, in fact, we don't see this decrease in mortality with age. Uh, our data, well, it doesn't span, what, 30 or 40 years as calico, so we only kept naked morals for about 10 years. But again, we don't really see age-related mortality. So how do we interpret that? There are different ways to look at it. Maybe current maximum lifespan of 30 years is just underestimation maybe they live much longer and this is why um, you know if we kept them longer we would start seeing this mortality so I, I don't know really uh, I think the claim that they don't age at all may be a little bit of an exaggeration but the fact that they are very long-lived uh, you know this is one thing we are sure about uh, we often hear that naked mole rats live to around 30 years old but if they are in a safe lab environment free from predation and other environmental hazards. Uh, so what do they die of? Uh, we mostly see deaths from fighting. They fight for dominance in the colony and this is yeah, uh, the you know, prevailing cause of death. I see. Uh, given that they do not appear to age outwardly, do you think that there could be much older specimens uh, out there that have gone unrecorded? Uh, well, in the wild, uh, they probably live shorter because, well, they are relatively protected uh, from predators just because of their subterranean lifestyle. Uh, but the data I've seen that in the wild, the average lifespan is around five to six years. So I don't know. You know, it's difficult to say where we could find those much older individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your landmark paper published in 2013, you and your team identified high molecular weight hyaluronan uh, as the chemical that triggers the anti-cancer response in the naked mole rat and attributed the rodent's longevity to having highly efficient protein synthesis. What is hyaluronan? Uh, hyaluronan is a polysaccharide, uh, so it's a sugar, a long linear polysaccharide, uh, it's an important component of extracellular matrix, so this is what fills space between cells. Uh, it's important, uh, you know, just as a filler, and it's also a signaling molecule. Uh, how do naked mole rats use uh, hyaluronan to resist cancer? Uh, well, for cancer resistance, what we see is that hyaluronan restricts cell proliferation. So our hypothesis is that it prevents pre-malignant cells from proliferating. So it stops, stops cancer uh, at hyperplasia stage. Uh, do we have hyaluronan and could we potentially use it in the same way? Well, yes, yes, we do. So hyaluronan is a very conserved molecule. Humans uh, also make it, human cells. We have it in our extracellular matrix. Uh, the difference is that we have uh, much less of it, I would say more than 10 times less than naked morons, and the length of those linear molecules is much shorter. Uh, we know that ma naked molar rats are highly resistant to cancer. Are they also very robust in general and resistant to various diseases or not? Yes, th this is true and this is the beauty of it. Uh, they're resistant to pretty much all diseases or at least diseases uh, that are associated with wear and tear. I mean, there are reports they may be more susceptible to certain infectious diseases, but in terms of uh, diseases of old age, uh, heart disease, um, degenerative disease in the brain, yeah, we just don't see it. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, you're s you study various animals, not just the naked mole rat, and you have said in the past that in every long-lived animal we have found a different pathway to longevity. Why have these species evolved to use different pathways to live longer and uh, are there shared mechanisms between the species that lead to longevity? No, this is a very good question. Yes, of course there are shared mechanisms, there are those conserved mechanisms that people found to be the same from geese to flies to mammals. 
Uh, but in addition to them, there are those unique mechanisms that allow certain species an advantage. And those are unique because usually they evolve in response to particular needs of that species, for example, uh, in a particular ecology of the species. Uh, naked morats evolve hyaluronin because they live underground and they needed it uh, to have very flexible skin to squeeze through the tunnels. Um, so that's what worked for them. Uh, humans didn't evolve these large quantities of hyaluronin because, well, we don't have this evolutionary pressure uh, to have extremely flexible skin. Um, and the, the same with other species. It's mostly dictated by their environment. And then, you know, that's why different mechanisms got picked up. Um, because longevity evolved multiple times. Within the same clade, we can have um, certain species short or long. So that's why every time once a species uh, was in an ecological niche where it's protected, where it's evolutionarily beneficial to live long time, so then it would use a slightly different strategy or completely different strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about aging in general. There are various hypotheses, including programming and damage, but how do you think we age? Are we programmed to die? Do we wear out? Or is the truth a mixture of both? Well, it's, uh, it's somewhat a mixture. I would say it's not that we are programmed to die, but we're just not programmed to live forever. <laughs> uh, so we are programmed uh, uh, to reach certain age, and usually the age of uh, you know, reproductive maturity. Um, and then, well, that's when animals reproduce, and after a while, body systems just start to fail. Uh, and then diseases uh, come, and th that's when, you know, and soon comes the end. So this is what we evolved, and, and this lifespan is different for every species, and again, uh, it evolved in response to the environment. Uh, for a mouse, it makes sense to live very short, uh, you know, like for a mouse, you, it wouldn't be beneficial to have capacity to live for 10 years because they never could. I mean, they would be eaten by predators by then. And for naked more rats, it, you know, it's still beneficial to live longer. So this is why I think this is what the program really is. You know, you program to uh, be active and uh, healthy up to certain age, somewhere, you know, past reproductive uh, maturity and later, you know, there is just ma maintenance mechanism but no longer working the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, genomic instability is thought to be a primary hallmark of aging and our ability to repair DNA damage and avoid mutations is a strong determinant of lifespan. Do you think that the cause of for DNA damage being a primary cause of aging has uh, grown stronger since the hallmarks of aging was published in 2013? If so, why and what particular studies do you think have been instrumental in supporting that? Oh, well, there is still debate about all these things. So what's the primary cause? What's the secondary cause? Maybe there are several primary causes. Uh, with genomic instability, the evidence is uh, there are various genetic disorders where DNA repair doesn't work very well. Uh, lots of them show uh, premature aging. So I would say um, impaired uh, DNA repair is associated with premature aging. I would say most premature aging syndromes that are known to date, they are a result of genomic instability. Uh, so the argument against it has always been, it's like, okay, um, you know, it's easy, you break something and then you see development of aging. Does it mean that this is the limiting factor? Because then the logic would be, if you improve DNA repair, then you have to live longer. And such experiment hasn't really been done because it was very difficult to improve DNA repair. Um, so, but right now we are trying to do that. So we found a way to make DNA repair more efficient by over expressing uh, sirtuin 6 protein. And uh, if we see that mice can live longer with it, so that would be a strong evidence uh, that genomic instability is the driver of aging. I mean, what so far, you know, another strong evidence we have is um, that among species, um, longer lived species have more efficient DNA repair. So this way there is association between better repair and longer lifespan. Mm -hmm. Some researchers argue that DNA mutations do not reach problematic levels during the normal human lifespan. 
How would you respond to this? No, th this is a good point, and again, you know, that was part of um, you know, the arguments in this debate. Um, right now, what, you know, counter-argument is, yes, you know, maybe mutations per se, you see, well, they're not that frequent. Uh, but mutations, especially mutations associated with defects in double strand break repair, so these are kind of rearrangement type mutations, uh, they affect much more than, you know, one gene where they occur. They change um, the structure, the chromatin structure of the region, and the impact of that is a little bit more difficult to measure, but it may be much greater. It may affect much larger segments of the genome, and this may perhaps explain aging. Uh, effect. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does appear that the longest lived species uh, have very stable genomes and efficient DNA repair. Do you think that we could enhance our own DNA and uh, mitochondrial DNA repair systems to increase on our longevity? No, I, I think it is possible, and that's really what we are working towards to find such a, you know efficient uh, and safe way of improving DNA repair. Uh, there has been considerable interest in NAD plus depletion therapies to boost DNA repair. Is this something you have been following? And what are your thoughts on boosting NAD plus biosynthesis via either precursors or more direct cell therapies? Well, there is various data around showing that there are certain benefits of supplementing NAD. Uh, the data I've seen, I mean, the solid data was that it improves the muscle aging. I don't know yet if it is as beneficial for other aspects of aging. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the challenges to discovering efficient DNA repair mechanisms and other longevity promoting mechanisms in other species and translating them to people? Oh, well, there are many challenges, but you know, again, I think it's all doable. Well, first of all, if you start working with new species, uh, sometimes not all the tools are available. Um, Although this is becoming less of a problem lately because molecular techniques are now applicable to uh, various species, we have genome information, uh, but the challenge is really to find the characterize the mechanism. Now once we know the mechanism, now we have to find a way to safely implement it in the different species. For hyaluronan that was very straightforward. Um, we have other cases from other long-lived animals where it's less straightforward, where there are concerns. Um, that maybe it won't be safe. Like, for example, there was a report that elephants have several copies of P53 gene. So do we increase activity of P53 in humans? Well, maybe not. Maybe it would kill too many cells. So there are all these considerations where we have to keep the balance. Um, but ultimately, it's possible. Uh, do you think that bringing aging under medical control is a plausible goal in the next few decades? Well, I, I'm optimistic. Of course, you know, this is a very philosophical question, but uh, we already see certain promising interventions that work, at least you know, in laboratory organisms. So I think it can be done in humans, and that would be a really um, breakthrough in healthcare and in society. Uh, do you think a, any personal health and longevity measures yourself? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't do any, anything crazy. I'm trying to eat healthy. I'm trying to exercise, um, eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, and that's about it. Um, and the last question, what's the biggest bottleneck in progress in aging research, to your view? Bottleneck? Well, I think funding is extremely important. Uh, aging research hasn't really been supported you know, to the same level as disease-focused research. So I think when there is enough funding, uh, there is enough support from uh, policymakers, uh, then you know, things go much faster. And then, you know, biology is not very easy. I mean, nothing is easy, but somehow we've seen a lot of progress in technology, but here to understand biology of aging and resolve it, we really have to understand these inner workings of the cell, which takes time, but ultimately it will be successful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, for, very much for taking the time to uh, share with our readers, and we wish you success in all your studies. You're very welcome.